like the cat background, Danielle. Thanks, Jennifer. You recognize it? No. <laughs> so you're not a Tiger King a fan? No, I'm not. Okay, well, we'll see if anybody else recognizes it. I'm going to stay on mute most of this session because, as you can hear, my daughter has her remote piano lesson right now. Ah. Which I thought would be fine since you were facilitating this yeah, session, I anyways. Think, I think we'll be fine. Great. <laughs> as soon as this is over. It's actually pretty good. How long have you been doing it? Since first grade. I'm pretty impressed. Thank you. We'll set the mood for folks as they join back. Is that a virtual background? That is a virtual background. It's cool. I'm changing them all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's April <laughs> Fool's Day. We gotta do okay. Something. Now I'm tempted to try one. Oh, I haven't downloaded any yet. So I can be. Oh, oh, no, I don't want to download the package right now. Okay, I'll, I'll play with that later. The frozen ones were great. <laughs> Thanks, Raven. <laughs> hey, Jen, did you get my note? I did get your note. It's okay. on my list. Oh, no, but, but why, uh, why I might have to buzz out. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah okay. no problem. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, people, I ex we expected people to go in and out, and I'm actually impressed by how many people haven't been zipping in and out. We've had a pretty consistent number. Yeah, my dog, I don't know, he's been in and out vomiting all day, so oh, not dear. good. Yeah. That's an essential uh, service, right? uh they are for yeah i think for emergency stuff yeah so we're watching him well, my vet sent me a email that they were in essential service oh good i think it depends by county potentially yeah i know a lot of them yeah you drive up and they take your pet from your car ah yeah that that i don't like so much yeah I'm I'm kind of a hands-on that way, so. I think that means I'd a lot of pets. I think that means a lot of pets don't get to go to the vet because some pets just don't take kindly to being picked up by strangers. <laughs> True enough. You know what makes me really mad is they they uh, did not consider acupuncturists um, essential. Wow. Well, I know that's, that's my that's my primary care person. My sister uses an, uses an acupuncturist for her RA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Raven, I'm in a similar boat. I go to the chiropractor and massage therapist about once a week, and they've been shut down as well. Yep. Yep, my chiropractor, yeah. The, 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 between that and my acupuncturist, that's my main care. Yeah. I've been working from my bed with my heating pad on days that I can't sit or stand at the desk all day. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey. We commiserate. What we have here? We still have a lot of people with their cameras off, so I'm assuming they're not back yet. Yeah, we're starting to come in. I, I'm, I'm here, but I'm still eating, so I'm, I'm sparing you that. Uh, I will do the same. I'm hey. going to do the same. I didn't get to eat as I was finishing up typing a note, so I'm going to turn my video off for this as well. Everybody's well, eating. It's okay. Yeah, it's fine to eat. I have my food. In fact, my food looks so much better than food I eat at, at the office. See how pretty my food is? Really impressed by it. If we were in person, you'd all be sitting next to each other, watching each other eat, so. <laughs> it's true. Um, Craig, are you with us yet? Yes. 
Hopefully you can hear me okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Great. Oh, there you are. I saw you earlier with a child. Have you given up your child care responsibilities for the next hour? Yeah, the two-year-old is, uh, he's not too conducive to having productive Zoom meetings, although he's a fun, fun addition to every Zoom meeting that I've had him on. I like your background. We've just been talking about that. Yeah, I'm in my home office slash closet right now. <laughs> quietest place in my house and figured you didn't need to see the my closet in the background. Ah. Has Catherine, have you joined us yet? I am. I'm on actually, I've joined you twice. One is so I can see it on my big screen and then the other is on my iPad. So you'll have to pick the one that has my voice. Well, I think the computer's already picked up, but Emily, if there's any kind of syncing that needs to go on, I'm sure you'll figure it out. I wonder then, it's hard for, I've had, or we've heard from a few people that they're um, just getting there, don't want to eat in front of us, but I think we'll just give it a couple more minutes to see that we have, um, see that we have a, a kind of minimum number to get started, and I'm just kind of double checking our, double checking our time on this to make sure we don't lose too much time. So we are supposed to start at 12.10 and speakers go till 1.10. So we have a full hour for this. Yeah. And I just want to give a couple more minutes to see if we get people. I think we're, I think we've got more than half people on camera now. What do you think? Yeah, I think we look good. Yeah, I think we'll get started. And Folks, yeah, I encourage you just to eat in front of us because you're not going to be, you're not going to be talking right for the next 20 minutes anyway. So, um, great. I'm just going to put this on the split screen so I know what I'm doing. And so I just want to thank you, thank our guests for the next hour. Um, we're really, really happy to have three decision makers at the state level with us to talk about Sigma implementation, what they're doing and what they're seeing. And so our three guests today are Craig Altair, who's chief of the GSP review section in DWR. And he's been, he has 14 years of experience in groundwater resources planning. His, everyone's biography is in our notes, but just so you know, he's in good shape and he's been doing a lot of these presentations. And Natalie Stork is the chief of the groundwater management program the State Water Resources Control Board and uh, served in the program before she became chief. Catherine Freeman is the chief consultant for the, Cal for the State Assembly's Committee on Water Parks and Wildlife. Before that, she served in the Senate Budget um, Subcommittee on Resources, Energy, and Environmental Policy. And before that, she worked in the Legislative Analyst Office. So she has more than 25 years of experience in policy and that policy review and analysis. So we're really happy to have them all here today. Um, I th we're gonna start with Craig and Atlee, you were gonna turn the, the steering wheel over to him. Yes, uh, we discussed and I'll just move through the slides for Craig. Go for okay. it, Craig. Okay, I will. Um, let's see. This slide looks a little different than it did on my screen. So uh, I'm not sure if some formatting got lost, but there's supposed to be a link at the bottom of this. Um, anyway, but I, I, before I start off, I mean, it's animated. Um, so my name is Craig Altair. I'm the chief of the GSP review section uh, at the Department of Water Resources in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office. And uh, as Jennifer mentioned, you know, the group that I, I work in is uh, responsible for the kind of the regulatory uh, aspect of the department's Sigma role and looking at groundwater sustainability plans and talking to the um, organizers, it sounds like uh, this group didn't really need um, too much in the way of background or Sigma 101. Um, so I thought maybe it would be helpful to focus on kind of what we've been doing the last couple of months and what are some of the big kind of things coming up that, that you all should be aware of. Um, so this slide uh, shows a Kind of conceptual timeline. It's taken from a fact sheet, a joint fact sheet that the department and the state board 
um, put out and the link is, is below uh, if you want to access the fact sheet. Um, what I really, really want to do is just use the highlight kind of some, again, some of the things we've been working on a few months. Uh, as, as everyone knows, January 31st, 2020 was the deadline for the critical air drafted basins to submit their GSPs. And, uh, and all the critical air drafted basins, plus a few others, uh, did submit their GSPs by that date. And the next slide I have will show a map of where those are. Actually, uh, before you go to this, uh, if you can go back to the previous slide first. Um, so in that kind of 20 day period between when the GSPs were submitted to us and when we posted them on the website, we were doing an, uh, basically we called it an acceptance review, but essentially we were checking that the PDFs they submitted, um, you know, worked, weren't corrupted, that the, the page numbers they gave us and their elements guides, which are those Excel um, uh, documents that, that describe kind of where each line item of the regulations can be found in the GSP at least based on a spot check, those appeared to be correct. And in some cases we noticed where some folks had offset their, their elements guide uh, by a couple pages, so we had that corrected. We verified that the shape files they submitted were, uh, other plan areas at least, were, um, were correct and that the entire basins were covered and there weren't any gaps or overlaps in, in, in GSP coverage. Um, we continue to make some, uh, um, to do some work to kind of clean up what was submitted um, even after the 20 days passed. And that's one of the primary errors that's, that's relating to is the, the references. Some of the uh, GSPs, or the GSAs uploading the GSPs had some problems uploading the references correctly. And so we noticed that um, a lot of the references were, were broken. So we're uh, even now continuing to work with a few of the GSAs. I think we're pretty much there. Um, but if you do notice as you're looking at a GSP that some of the references aren't, uh, the links to the references aren't working, just let us know and we'll We'll work with the GSAs, GSAs to get that fixed. Uh, we're also continuing to work with the GSAs on, on making sure that they loaded all of their um, uh, representative monitoring sites correctly into our monitoring network module. And so uh, we are continuing to work with, with them again, kind of around the annual report also uh, to make sure that the data they upload for the annual report um, uh, uses things like correct reference points and things like that. Um, but by and large, well, entirely, uh, the GSPs that we got, we, we, we posted uh, by that 20-day deadline, uh, with the exception of one sub-basin, the Madera sub-basin, which we can uh, talk about later if we need to, uh, where the GSPs weren't accepted. But the posting of those GSPs triggered uh, a public comment period. Uh, as shown on this graphic, the public comment period, kind of the minimum time period is 60 days. Um, uh, as stated in the regs, uh, we initially opened it up to a 75 day public comment period. And due to the um, COVID situation, we've extended that comment period by an additional 30 days. And the, the uh, so you can stay on the slide, but the next slide I have will show the individual basins and their uh, comment period close dates. So now we're, uh, the department is into our um, technical review phase, essentially. So we're checking each of the GSPs. We have teams of scientists and geologists and engineers uh, at headquarters and in our four region offices that are reviewing each and every GSP uh, kind of right now as we speak uh, to determine, you know, of course, we're kind of still not first read. Uh, some of these documents are quite long. I think Kern County Subbasin, in total, there was about 13,000 pages of material submitted. Um, so we're doing those, those reviews now. Um, but ultimately, our ultimate goal is to determine which, you know, which GSPs comply with the objectives of SIGMA, substantially comply with the GSP regulations, um, and can be passed or found to be approved. Um, we do have kind of three options at the end of the day in terms of, of each plan review. Uh, plans are either approved, in which case the GSAs need to continue implementing those plans, and they'll provide annual reports and five-year updates. Uh, GSPs can be found to be incomplete, in which case um, there would be a six month, a maximum six month period to fix those deficiencies that resulted in it being found incomplete, um, or the GSP could be found to be inadequate if there were significant deficiencies. Um, and that finding of an inadequacy would only happen uh, after consultation with the state board. Uh, what's not shown on this timeline is that throughout the whole, um, even before phase one, before the GSPs were submitted, department and, and state board have been coordinating very closely. Um, Natalie and I talk, you know, at least weekly um, and, and have regular check-ins and, and meetings with our, in our staff. So uh, we are coordinating quite closely. Uh, when a GSP is found to be, or is, is going to be found to be inadequate, 
um, we will have that more formal consultation with the state board too, as as uh, required um, by statute. So we can go to the next uh, slide. I just want to show here uh, one of the most important things on the slide is really that last column of the um, the table in the right. That's the, the comment period closing date. So I mentioned that we had initially had a 75 day public comment period um, that started based on when we posted the GSBs. Uh, those comment periods have been extended and this column uh, on the map uh, reflects the extended comment period date. So uh, roughly half of the GSPs, the comment period will close in mid-May and then the other half roughly uh, public comment period closes um, in early June. So um, one thing I would encourage you know, everyone to do is to, as you're reading these uh, GSPs, or as you've read them and interacted with the GSAs, preparing them um, in the lead up to them submitting the GSP, and you have comments, uh, please do submit those comments to the department. Uh, our, our Sigma portal is the most efficient way to, to get comments to us. And um, we will be considering all the comments, all the comments that we receive um, during our review uh, process. See, next slide. And, um, and we think the, the trailer hitch is in the camper. Right. On mute. Uh, Raven, you need to mute or I'll do it for you. Then. Sorry, love. So um, I just want to wrap up and talk about, you know, the next steps. Uh, first one, annual reports for water year 2019 are due uh, by statute today. Um, we have uh, notified the GSAs that due to this, um, you know, COVID pandemic uh, situation that we will accept late, um, late annual reports. We don't have a kind of ability to waive statutory deadlines or change statutory deadlines in the department, but we can accept reports that are submitted late. Um, and so, um, and I think about, and I had a colleague of mine pull together some statistics that I, well, but roughly half of the GSBs uh, have submitted their annual reports uh, as of uh, early this morning. Um, and many others have started their reports and several have let us know that they will you know, be submitting them by May 1st, for example. Um, so I think uh, we can talk more about those once we uh, have a chance to review those. Um, and again, finally, the, the comment period closes either May 15th, excuse me, or June 3rd. And I would encourage uh, all of you to use this link to, uh, to go to the Sigma portal and submit those public comments. So I have one more slide, but it's really just a link to some of the resources we've got. Uh, if you have any questions, um, send them to the sgmps at water.ca.gov. Uh, program staff do check that email every day. Uh, we have our DWR Sigma listserv where we notify um, about all Sigma related activities that the department um, uh, undertakes, but maybe most importantly, we notify uh, when GSPs are posted and when public comment periods are um, enacted and extended. The Sigma portal there will take you to all the info about GSPs and GSAs and alternatives. And our Sigma data viewer, the last link, is where you can go to look at uh, a lot of the data we've got related to groundwater conditions for each of the six uh, undesirable results, as well as GSA boundaries and other uh, political boundaries. And uh, if you haven't used the Sigma data viewer, I encourage you to take a look. Uh, there's a lot of information there, and hopefully it's a, a useful resource. So I wanted to keep it short. That's all I've got. But uh, happy, I'm sure there'll be plenty of time for questions later or now. Thanks. Okay. No, that's fine. I think we're going to move and do all our presentations and then open it up for questions. We are tracking all the questions that are coming up in the chat screen. So thanks a lot, folks, for doing that and keep um, keep entering them or keeping track of them. Uh, Natalie, it's your turn. All right. I'm not muted anywhere. <laughs> All right, so um, I just sort of wanted to start off for a moment and uh, recognize that we all made it past January 2020. We're already in, uh, oh gosh, April. But um, yeah, with the January 2020 deadline, as Craig showed in his slide with all the different basins and all the different comment periods, um, you know, a lot of work was done on the part of DWR, the State Water Board, the GSAs, all the NGOs out there providing comments and, and information. And, um, and we got, you know, all but uh, one basin's plan submitted. So that was, that was pretty big. And now we're on to plan review. 
Um, so talking a little bit about plan review, um, right now our focus at the State Water Board is on coordinating with the Department of Water Resources. Um, we've got plan review, sorry, we have a formal consultation role. DWR makes the formal decisions on adequacy according to the statute, but anytime DWR is considering failing a plan, they have to have a formal consultation consultation with the State Water Board. So we are, um, we'll be looking at plans and preparation for that happening um, since DWR only has two years to make their final decisions. We'll be looking at plans so we're ready to consult. Also, the State Water Board has unique expertise. We have our Division of Water Rights, our Division of Drinking Water, um, and our Division of Water Quality, and we have a lot of expertise at the board. So we'll of course be wanting to use that expertise and draw on it to look at certain aspects of plans and communicate what we find to the Department of Water Resources. So that's where we are right now in terms of plan review. Now when it comes to basins where plans weren't submitted um, or there's a finding of inadequacy, uh, whether that's already or coming down the line in the future, then the, uh, the next step is state intervention authorities. So next slide, please. Thanks. All right, so on this slide, I've got some details about what happens when we hit a probationary determination. So if DWR finds a plan to be inadequate, um, or if a plan wasn't submitted in the case of one of these basins where a plan was submitted, but it didn't have the coordination agreement signed, so it's essentially inadequate or not a plan. Um, there's a period of time, and then the State Water Board um, can decide to take the basin to make a probationary determination for the basin. This is a discretionary determination. So the State Water Board doesn't have to determine a basin to or find it to be probationary. But in that process, there's several things that happen. The first one is that the State Water Board makes decisions about how much of the basin should be taken into probation, or also if the board should exclude um, pumpers from reporting requirements. So basically, who, who's on probation and who has to report to the State Water Board. In the statute, it says that 90 days after a probationary determination, people subject to that determination who extract groundwater have to report their um, groundwater extraction to the board. Um, that's because the board needs to gather data in case that in case we need to write our own interim plan. Um, but during both before and during probation, there's time in there to fix the issues that um, either triggered our state intervention authorities or triggered probation. So um, prior to a probationary determination, we're going to be looking at the situation in the basin, communicating with local interested parties and GSAs and trying to fix those issues before we even get to probation. Once probation happens, there's six months to a year before the board can start working on an interim plan, and that's another sort of timeout period where the board can work with people in the basin to fix the issues um, before we go into the next step of state intervention. And one of the, the last bullet on here, um, one of the important things is, so the board's going to be gathering data to get the information it needs in case it needs to um, write its own interim plan, but the board can also require meters to ensure that it gets good data um, regarding how much water is being taken out of the basin. Um, so those are some of the large scale things that will be happening uh, when a basin is put on probation. Um, another thing is when it comes to gathering data, the board also has um, investigation order authority. And so if we need to get more information via special studies or other things, or we can, if we don't get that information voluntarily, we can actually order that information. So probationary is largely a time when we go through the issues, try and resolve them, but also get the data we need to try and figure things out. Um, of course, you know, the goal is to 
have groundwater management be successful at the local level. So we'll be trying to fix those issues both before and during probation before it goes any further. Um, so diving into the details a little bit on the timelines, if you could hit the next slide, please. So here I've got some details on what would what the timeline would look like for a basin that's put on probation. Um, there's a few requirements in the statute, and there's also some general things that we'd be doing as part of um, good practices. So a probationary determination is an um, open and transparent process, and there is actually a hearing in front of the board. And so if we are going towards probation, um, there are requirements. There's a 90-day notice that goes to cities, counties, and GSAs, and a 60-day notice that has to go to all the pumpers in the basin. Um, because this is an open and transparent process, and we also don't want to surprise everyone in a basin, we, in this scenario, would be having a lot of public meetings throughout the basin or the county, wherever this is happening, so that we can get the relevant information out to people and know how it impacts them before they even get that 60-day notice. So um, if issues aren't fixed anywhere on this timeline, then the next step would be going to that probationary hearing where the board would actually make a determination on whether or not to put the basin on probation. So there would be information presented by staff, there would be public comment, and the board would make their decision at that time. Um, and again, they have a lot of flexibility in how they can act in terms of how much of the basin to put on probation and um, which pumpers are required to report. And then um, assuming that the board uh, makes a decision that the basin's put on probation after 90 days, all of the groundwater pumpers in the basin need to start recording monthly pumping data so that they can submit that. Um, we've got a water year reporting cycle. And so the subsequent December 15th um, of after the, the water year in which they start reporting, the first reports are due and fees come soon after. And in terms of reporting and what that means, um, we have an online reporting system where everyone subject to reporting requirements will log on and enter some basic information. Um, they have to click where their well is located. They have to click the place of use for the water. Um, they need to report how much water their well can pump, how much it actually does pump on a monthly basis. And it's a, it's a pretty simple, clean system. It's fast to fill out those reports, um, but it is a required reporting system. Everyone will be required to report online if they're subject to those reporting requirements. And then the board is required to recover the cost of their program. So everyone that submits a report is going to be required to pay a fee. There's a base fee and there are um, per acre foot pumping fees and an automatic lake fee. So that is in essence what probation looks like. Um, again, throughout this, wherever we need more information, um, we'll be doing information orders as necessary if we can't otherwise get the information we need. So next slide, please. Thanks. So um, many of you have seen my presentation, um, Sigma presentations before, I've probably seen this slide. Um, this is just a snippet of what an interim plan would look like. Um, if we can't fix issues, once we have that probationary determination, then six months to a year later, we start working on that interim plan. Um, the corrective actions are really the most important part. It's how we get the basin back on track. Of course, the goal is always to hand management back to the locals when they're ready to, to manage the basin sustainably. Um, corrective actions are most likely going to be pumping cutbacks, but the statute does provide several different options. But the goal is to fix issues before we get to the interim plan phase. And throughout the whole probationary process, we're gonna be coordinating very closely with the Department of Water Resources. Since the goal is to get the basin back in their shop, we wanna make sure that their expertise and, and knowledge, we draw on that and we coordinate closely. So it's a seamless process to um, get the basin back on track once the issues are fixed. And last slide, please. So, um, the State Water Board and DWR um, focused on 
on uh, local success, we've put out a series of fact sheets um, to try and get information out regarding uh, what the options are and sort of, you know, what's in the statute and, and sort of some things to think about. And this is just um, sort of, this isn't all of the fact sheets we've put out, but some of the big ones. Um, we've put up fact sheets on probation, um, state and regional board basics, and some of the things that are important to us. Um, state water boards put out fact sheets on stakeholder inclusion, how it's important and how it makes plans stronger. And we also put out a water quality FAQ. The audience for that particular FAQ is GSAs, but it um, has reminders of things that should be considered when um, developing the water quality portion of their plans. Now for the 2020 basins, um, their plans are already submitted, uh, but we're hoping that they'll still be looking to this FAQ for information as they start implementing their plans. And, um, and again, we've got the Division of Water Quality. When it comes to plan review, we're already sort of looping them in to get information that we, you know, we will coordinate with DWR and, and, um, and have some conversations. Ultimately, it's their decision. Um, and for more information on that part of the process, uh, DWR and State Water Board have a joint fact sheet on the overview of submittal and evaluation of GSPs. So that's just a, a sort of a snippet of state intervention, where we are now, what our timelines are like, um, and what we're doing to try and help um, GSAs be successful, um, consider what they need to consider and, and uh, develop and implement good plans. Thank you so much, Natalie. And so just for everyone's edification, we'll include links to all of the fact sheets that have been referenced by both Craig and Natalie as part of your, um, our post-conference uh, list of documents. So I just want to move on now to Catherine. Um, so Catherine doesn't have a presentation, so we've got this nice seal, the state of California. It's just going to talk to us a little bit about um, the legislature's role in Sigma. So take it from the top, Catherine. Hey, everybody. It's nice to talk to you. Um, I think that what I'd like to start with is some of the questions that we've been getting um, from the legislature about what on earth is going on with the legislature um, so that you can get a sense of the fact that we're actually still working and we're still doing all of the things that um, you might think we're doing like preparing for hearings which is why my background looks a little bit like an office um, but specifically to sigma a number of us have had worked on sigma and have a very strong feeling that we have to let the process move forward um, we have had a series of inquiries or bills um, that have really um, pushed the direction of Sigma. So for example, this year we had a bill that would prioritize a certain um, uh, constituent, which would be managed wetlands. That's sort of duck hunting clubs. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing with authors that have legislation like that is to push back and say, well, wait a minute, if you get to be in the front row, then doesn't everybody else get to reassess what Sigma is? Um, and so we've been pretty successful sort of saying, listen, why don't you comment on the basins? Why don't you work, do the work that you think that needs to be done? And then if you think there's still a problem after the, the GSAs, GSPs have been submitted and the review has happened, then we need to come back and help, um, help you out. But for now, um, I think both my counterpart, Dennis O'Connor and I have said, no changes to Sigma unless it's an absolute emergency. Now that said, um, we are in the middle of an emergency and the legislature is uh, working remotely um, and not meeting. Um, so if there are questions about deadlines that folks have, I think that that's a reasonable thing to talk to us about. Um, but it would be something that we really did in coordination with the, uh, the governor's office and with the departments because we don't really want to let things slide with Sigma. Um, it, it took a long time to put this package together. It took a lot of education by so many people and we need to kind of move forward with it so that, you know, we can get um, a good result. Um, so the legislature has, um, uh, I don't, if you guys want me to talk a little bit about what the legislature is doing, it's, it just gets more exciting. Um, every day we get a new memo 
about what we're doing. Uh, and so the big thing that's happening right now is we've been told that there's going to be what's called a workload budget. Um, and I've worked in budget for a long time. A workload budget means that we are going to create a budget in the state of California that does not change very much at all, um, except for maybe things that are very related to the current crisis. And the reason for that is that we pushed back the um, tax return deadline. Sorry, I call it tax return because I, I try to focus on a tax return. But the revenues um, have been pushed back until June 15th. So imagine doing a blind budget. There's no, we have no idea what the revenues are. We, we really don't know what expenditures are. So what's likely to happen in the next couple of months is that we put together a budget that's a bare bones, no change budget. And then I think most people on the phone have heard of a um, budget bill junior. And that's where we make the, the actual, we'll probably make the more changes to, um, to the budget. Um, I would anticipate that before August 30th, 31st, we would have what's called a cut drill. Um, if we don't have the revenues coming in, um, we probably will be looking at cuts. The reason that I'm mentioning this isn't, you know, isn't the dire warnings and all of the things that we're already having. It's, it's that if we're looking at additional funding for groundwater management plans or the development of plans, or in my case, I've been working pretty hard on um, a, a bond, a natural resources bond, what happens then? Um, do we continue? Do we continue with a bond that will likely result in general fund expenditures coming out of the, um, the next year's budget if it's passed by the voters. Um, and I think that there's a lot to be to ask about what's actually in the state's general fund expenditure budget and what we think is going to happen. Um, I wouldn't lie if I said I, I'm a little worried about funding for groundwater management. Um, Ten years ago we had none, I think almost zero uh, in the state budget. And this is, um, it's been unprecedented in the last five years that we started putting money into groundwater management, uh, including the development of the GSAs and the GSPs. So I think there's a, a risk that we lose um, some of the funding for areas that really need help uh, in the state. In terms of um, the legislature's work, we do have a return date at this moment in time of April 13th. I'm hoping that's not real. Um, and I, I would imagine that they're considering a return date that's more in line with what the Bay Area's uh, shelter in place is and the um, states. But the legislature provides a very important role in a moment like this to be the check and balance for the governor. Um, and we, you know, in times like this, we give the governor a lot of leeway, and that's good. Um, and folks have been working very well remotely. But we also have to kind of uh, make sure that there's no, I wouldn't say it's shenanigans, but there's no uh, um, activities that are happening that would go against the legislative uh, directives. So most of the boards and departments that I work with have shifted um, deadlines where they're able to, to accommodate folks because of COVID. Um, there are several though that um, we don't know exactly what that means. So just to take one that's not related to Sigma, the flood board has the authority now to move some deadlines. So I don't know what that means. Um, and I don't know what the water board or DWR are going to do with their deadlines, but um, it, it is reasonable to expect that we give people a little extra time to move through this. Um, if anybody is remote access is like mine, um, you know, I might've thrown my phone at the wall once or twice, maybe more. Um, so just some things to think about as we're working through uh, the legislative session. Um, finally, uh, I wanted to just talk about a couple of bills that we've been um, looking at. They pop up periodically, and that's um, groundwater recharge as a beneficial use uh, um, under the under water rights laws. Um, these are really controversial bills um, that sort of fundamentally look at what does it mean to have a water right, um, how long can you keep a water right for? And um, is groundwater, just the, the essence of groundwater in the basin, um, a beneficial use for under the state's law? Um, we have, I think in the legislature, been successful in helping members to shift a little bit away from that concept and look more at how can we support local communities um, in their implementation of SIGMA. 
So can we help them to create, and the water board has been a huge part of this, um, a program where we take excess flows and move them into groundwater basins. Um, you know, the jury's out if that's the best way to, to do um, groundwater recharge. Um, but one of the things that I've run into, and it's been sort of my, a little mini mission of mine, is to talk about infrastructure um, in a different way, to talk about inner ties, to talk about my favorite subject, which is chunk lines. Everybody loves a good chunk line. Being able to move water from one water district to another and um, you know, move water into groundwater basins. There's a lot of controversy about that. And we have to think about what happens when you move one molecule of water into another basin. Um, it's pretty controversial. So I think the legislature has a lot to think about before we pass a strong law that says, oh gee, we should be able to do X, Y, or Z. And that's where the discussions before about water markets are really important. They're, they're not perfect. So we have to think about how do we um, guard against uh, danger. Um, I think that's all I really wanted to say until somebody wants to give us some questions about the legislature. I'm happy to provide some uh, colorful commentary on my employment. Thank you very much, Catherine. So we've already got, um, about a dozen questions um, through our chat function. Be, feel free to use the chat. I'm gonna ask a question of each participant before I open up to more questions. And I'm gonna to try to combine some of these questions because a lot of them are fairly similar. So Craig, I wanna start with you. And there's a lot of questions about um, sort of how DWR is gonna find plans inadequate. Is it gonna take the full two years? and Will the, what does that six month fixed uh, incomplete period mean? If it's not, in, if they haven't fixed things in the first six months, are they gonna get another six months? Or do we really have a hard and fast rule that six months mean reduction? So that's kind of a general piece. So can you talk a little bit about what's gonna happen? Sure. <laughs> um, so, I mean, as you mentioned, we have, the that statute gives us two years to review plans. Um, and certainly um, with the alternatives we took, uh, which didn't have a two-year deadline, we took a little over two years. Um, uh, our plan though is that, you know, having learned some of those lessons and built our program you know, substantially since those early days when it was just a small handful of folks in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office, um, that we're gonna try to expedite the review of some of the GSPs. So, you know, I can't give you any firm deadlines like, you know, it's definitely going to happen within a year that we get some of them out, but that, I mean, kind of internally is what I'm shooting for is to get some of them out in that year time. Um, you know, one of the things we need to do is kind of obviously wait to see what comes in in terms of public comment, and that's been extended now. But um, as we, sorry, as we, um, you know, get a few, and, and as we're kind of reviewing them initially, and again, there are about 46 plans right now. Uh, we'll start to identify those that can be expedited. Um, you know, it's important, I think, to get information out to to other GSAs that are preparing GSPs now, if we can, early. Um, you know, to show what an approved GSP looks like, for example. Um, I think most likely those, you know, expedited reviews would come from basins, you know, likely that have just a single plan. Uh, where there are multiple plans in a basin, we didn't talk about that so much yet, but where there are multiple plans in a basin with a coordination agreement, that just really takes the the level of review up, uh, up a notch in terms of the kind of the coordination element um, between those plans. Um, the six month is incomplete, yeah, you're right. So basically, if, if a plan um, has a deficiency that really precludes approval, then we can and, you know, identify those deficiencies and provide that information back to the, to the GSA. And, yet, and the, the six months is, is built into our regulation, so we really can't go beyond that. Um, um, if there are kind of, you know, minor deficiencies, um, if the plan seems, you know, a, a good initial effort that, that can be implemented and we approve the plan, we can also give some recommended corrective actions or you know, recommended actions to, to improve the plan moving forward, um, which we did with the approved alternatives. Certainly no alternative was, was perfect and no, I'm sure there will be no GSP that's perfect, uh, despite all the hard work that went into them. So. Um, we definitely, I'm, I'm sure in, in all cases, I'm fairly confident that we'll, we'll give recommended actions, uh, even if we approve a GSP. 
Uh, was there anything else in that question that I didn't answer? Oh, um, I think that was a good start. I think I'm going to try to, there's just a, I'm getting a whole slew of questions in, so I'm just trying to figure out how to allocate them. Natalie, just, uh, I just have a quick clarification on the probationary process of um, requiring um, folks to report withdrawals and pay fees. So we have questions about how ag withdrawals are measured versus say beverage companies, what that reporting looks like, and also about the fees and how small farmers might, um, if small farmers are gonna be disproportionately impacted if you're using a baseline fee. Okay. All right, I appreciate all of those questions. Um, I'll start off with the fees. So um, the base fee right now is set at $300 per well. And then there's a volumetric fee. Um, right now, I think for probation, oh, I don't have my, at work I have a sticky note with all the fees in front of me so I don't have to memorize them. I think it's about $35 per acre foot, um, but don't quote me on that. Um, but there's a couple different things. One is we can change the fees at any time via the emergency regulation process. And the fees do need to be in line with recovering the cost of our program. Um, we also have an opportunity to change the fees when we go to a probationary hearing if the board determines the basin to be probationary. Um, I do hear a concern about smaller farmers being um, disproportionately impacted if there are big per well fees. So that's something that we will um, look at. We, we do want the costs to be appropriate in terms of how we recoup the cost of our program. Also right now, this statute doesn't give us the ability to waive fees for anyone. And so that's something that we're also looking at right now. Um, going back through the emergency regulation process um, so that if parties um, report on time, report their groundwater use and aren't having um, a significant impact on the basin, um, we're hoping that the board could potentially waive fees on a case by case basis. So that is something that we are scoping out and hoping to include in a future emergency regulation. Um, so if there are situations where there are going to be disproportionate impacts, we do want to hear about that so we can consider that and make sure that we have an, an open and fair and transparent system. Um, regarding the second question about beverage companies versus ag, et cetera, um, our reporting system, it you need to enter information on the purpose of use, um, et cetera but it really is focused on how much water is pumped per month per well. That's really what it comes down to. Um, and that's what fees are based on right now. And then quickly for Catherine, um, there's been a lot of discussion of the San Joaquin Valley Blueprint Economic Analysis done by David Sunday, published last month. And I think what a lot of people are trying to understand the legislature, members of the legislature seem to be paying close attention to that analysis. We don't have money to throw around trying to do our own economic analysis to refute that, even though it has a lot of problems. How do you recommend that we approach the legislature to sort of represent our um, concerns or counter um, what ag is, big ag is doing? Um, I think the, the one of the best ways to do this is to um, sort of acknowledge one that they made a shot at it. Um, it's not the best ac economic analysis I've seen. Um, and they did something strategic, which is to remove the sort of heavy emphasis on uh, a new dam. So that's interesting. They do acknowledge that they have to change their um, their direction. I actually think that we have allies um, um, on both sides uh, in the academic fields. I have to say I'm not really allowed to say whether I like it or don't like it, um, but I do think that UC Berkeley and others are doing some good work on um, what the real impacts are going to be. I think the thing that's hardest for me is the surety that we are going to lose and follow X amount of fields and not having any sense of what the decisions that could be made 
good decisions that could be made that could change the way that we farm or that we use land. Um, I, I really am a little disappointed, sort of all over the place, that we just assume that we are going to shut down, you know, mass industries. This is not the thing about Sigma is this: this didn't come up as fast as a pandemic, where we really are shutting industries. Um, this is something that we can move from, you know, tree crops to row crops or some other kind of, um, of agricultural method. But from my conversations with farmers, that is just a non-starter. We farm what we want and we're going to move, uh, you know, forward as we want. Um, one of the biggest concerns I have about the blueprint is um, that it, it, it really focuses a lot on the same molecule of water being used in many different ways. Um, and it's not possible. So I, I would like to take a little bit more serious look at what the, um, what's going to happen in the valley. And then just finally, the one thing that the blueprint probably does get right is that we do need a little bit more infrastructure to move water around. And the dual benefit of that is that we can help support some of our poorest communities through, you know, movement of, of clean water, maybe not treated water, so we do have to work on that, but clean water from one area of the, um, the valley to another. And I think for my boss and for the legislators, that is one of the most critical things that we can, um, we can work on. Thank you. Hey, I want to open up to some questions now, and I, I have it. Go ahead and raise your hands, but I want to start by, Robbie, you had a question about water quality for both DWR and the State Water Board. Would you care to just state it? Do you want to tell us in person what that is? Sure. Can you hear me? Can yes, you know? we can. Okay, great. Um, so our, I'm in the Kuyama Basin and our GSA, though community comment has consistently been around the issues of water quality, our GSA has basically refused to address them. And they're just really minimally in the plan. And they keep deferring to other agencies and saying, oh, we really don't have to deal with that. Um, so I'm curious as to what the State Water Board and DWR's interaction is going to be around water quality and what the expectations are of what um, the Water Board already has in place and how that will influence um, GSPs. Okay. Um, Craig, if it's okay, I'll take a stab at it first and then you can talk next. Okay, so around water quality and GSPs. Um, with the State Water Board, we have the Division of Water Quality and we have the Regional Water Quality Control Boards, which have a plethora of, of water quality programs. They are the primary water quality regulators in the state. And GSAs um, are going to need to consider all of the different programs when implementing their GSPs. Um, not our Sigma statute doesn't supersede any other water quality related statute, nor does that supersede Sigma. So everyone needs to still be compliant with all of these different programs. Um, and that being said, um, you know, everything doesn't necessarily fit into Sigma when it comes to water quality regulation. So Sigma is going to be an important piece of the puzzle in some respects, but in other respects, there may be water quality issues that are best handled through um, a different state or regional board program. So we will be the state water board, um, you know, working with the division of water quality to look at the water quality parts of these plans and see if there's any red flags or um, issues we want to bring up with DWR or if we see a potential management action that could make water quality worse or hurt compliance with another program. Um, so that's just a, a bit on sort of where we're thinking about water quality right now. Craig, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, the, I mean, Natalie, actually, I mean, this is uh, uh, thinking about a presentation you gave recently. You had a good slide, um, so let me give credit where it's due. But just to describe it um, in words, it's kind of suggesting that they're you know, acknowledging that there are all these other programs, um, many of which um, are kind of housed within the, the state board or the regional boards. Um, you know, when the GSA is developing a GSP, ideally, they would at least kind of translate how those other existing programs work into into Sigma, how they relate. If there's a Know, kind of a, th a threshold for a different program. How does that translate into their GSP, if at all? 
And I, I kind of like that, that phrase of translating between these programs. Um, so hopefully that's what um, you know, we'll see in the GSPs, if not the ones that have been submitted, um, at least the ones being prepared for 2022. Well, I do have to say that we've been told there's a lack of translation among us Sigma uh, GSA. So, and I think that may go to water quality as well. But just moving on to more questions. So you can raise your hand if you like. Otherwise, I'm gonna ask Sonia, you asked a couple of questions. So I'm gonna let you decide what the most important question is and ask it on screen. And I'll see if, if you haven't already unmuted yourself, I will unmute you. Sure, thank you. Um, I guess one of the questions that I asked, and we do have several, and I see that several people have a lot of questions, so I think there's a lot of, you know, uncertainties and things that we like to clarify, but um, the one I'd like to ask is how will the human right to water be considered in the GSP reviews? So I can start off and Natalie may want to add on to yeah, that is one of the things that we need to consider in implementing our regulations is the human right to water. Um, I think that, you know, as I'm learning more about the human right to water, partially the, um, the uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of items in the regulations that I think will, you know, complying with those will go a step towards at least complying with the human right to water. So, uh, you know, GSA's uh, per the regulations need to you know, consider the beneficial uses and users of water, incorporate feedback from them, engage with them, et cetera, to understand um, those needs. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, there's not a you know, hard and fast you know, number of wells or other kind of quantitative thing that says you've definitely complied with the human right to water, but we will be taking a holistic view. I mean, we, we have to get to the end of our plan review. One of the things we, need, we will be asking ourselves and documenting is, you know, is this plan consistent the human right to water. I guess I would be um, surprised that a plan would get through all of the regulatory requirements and then not be, yeah, and then that we find that, that it didn't comply with, or it wasn't, uh, sorry, consistent with the human right to water. So I think, you know, kind of complying with a lot of those regulatory elements will help uh, get there. Uh, now, and then Natalie and I, of course, talk, um, have been talking about this and, and know that we'll be talking about that quite a bit in the future as well. So maybe we can ask Natalie to talk about, since the State Water Board actually has guidance on implementing the human right to water, and DWR doesn't, is that going to be a significant portion of your comments? Well, right now the State Water Board is really focused on the new SAFER program, um, which is implementing the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Act. Um, so that's really where a lot of the focus is right now. And when it comes to looking at these plans, we will be having conversations with our Division of Drinking Water and our SAFER team to figure out how these issues fit in the framework of Sigma, SAFER, and other drinking water programs. Um, it may be that when we're looking at plans from the Sigma lens, we may be looking for issues where um, it would make the situation worse for communities um, where, you know, water quality could be impacted by management actions and highlighting those issues. So we do um, have guidance and information out there on the human right to water and we are committed, you know, as for, um, when it comes to policy to ensuring that we consider the human right to water. And so that is something that will play into our review going forward, um, but we're figuring out where it fits in amongst these different regulatory contexts. So that is a approached in a, in a, in a well-defined way. Also just asking people to raise your hands. We just have five minutes left that we ought to be able to get a couple more questions in. Um, just in a question from Felice was whether your review of these plans is going to be public. That's for you, Natalie. Oh, sorry. So um, everything the board does is public um, is the, the short answer. Um, we are always open to having conversations with the public. Everything can be PRA'd and um, 
it's public in that respect. And anytime you want to give us a call and have a conversation, we're um, open to, to talking to you about, you know, where where our concerns are and what we're thinking. You know, we're still working out some of the, the the puzzle pieces in some situations, but everything we do is open and transparent and public. Um, great. So just, um, I wonder if, if, uh, Sandy, uh, can, you had a question for Catherine. Can you repeat it on screen? You want me to just to say it? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, Catherine, are you, are you here, you know, kind of coupled with that question that, that Jennifer had been asking about the, about the blueprint and kind of folks making the case that this implementation is hard coupled with the um, you know likely recession are you hearing anything about folks trying to undermine delay reduce the authorities of sigma um so the answer is complicated um one if you know me i'm skeptical about just about everybody on the planet uh, so I'm worried all the time about people trying to mess with, um, with Sigma. Um, I do think that there will be people that try to undermine it. Um, just given the number of inquiries that I've gotten about, well, hey, can't we just change this so it benefits my whatever it is constituent? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what we have to hope to, for is that for the folks that are at DWR and the Water Board and then also really the legislature to hold firm and let the next you know 60 days roll out um, and i'm not talking about COVID. i'm talking about the dwr um, uh, review process where we get the information in and then we need to i think be vigilant um, and and also helpful i mean i know this, those things sound very different but vigilant and helpful in making sure that the review is done in a robust and adequate way I mean, I can't tell you how many people have said, why don't you just change this this way? And I say, well, did you actually ever submit a letter to DWR on the groundwater basin that you're talking about? And they say, well, no. And I said, well, let's start with step one and then we'll work through your next issues. Great. Um, Angie raised her hand, so go ahead, Angie. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I had a question for Craig, um, and this is just kind of regarding around the notice and communication um, piece in the GSP review. Um, what um, do you consider, like what has CWR discussed as like considering an acceptable outreach um, for like that component, like for, an example with some of the GSAs um, that we've kind of been like kind of going through the GSP uh, reviews, um, we've noticed that they've only kind of paid attention to email blasts and there wasn't any discussions regarding like workshops or any like kind of just like community um, oriented type of workshops to have them be held in like certain communities that are disadvantaged. So I was just wondering, like, when you're reviewing that section, what is it that DWR is going to consider as appropriate outreach um, in the GSPs? Yeah, so good question. Um, the, the requirements in the, in the GSP regs for that notice and communication section um, aren't prescriptive in terms of, you know, having certain you know, numbers of, of meetings or even how, how meetings are held. Um, so there isn't, uh, and probably not terribly satisfying for you, a, a, a black and white answer that applies to all basins. Mm -hmm. um, what we you know, will be looking for is that the GSAs are describing how they did their, their outreach, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether there are any limitations to that, and, and if they need to you know, change things going forward. Um, I think where, again, just to get back on the, the public comments, you know, it does help to to get public comments if, if there are, uh, you know, any out there that describe, you know, the limitations from a stakeholder perspective of the, um, the communications and outreach and engagement plans, um, you know, through the drafting uh, phase and then the plans moving forward to, to continue that engagement. You know, I think GSAs were 
you know, even though it's, it was five years uh, since Sigma passed, um, some of them were up, you know, against pretty tight deadlines at the end. And, you know, I suspect, for example, that some of the comments that were submitted on the draft plans, um, just due to the timing of when those comment periods were opened and closed, you know, weren't, um, you know, weren't able to be included. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we have a good start and, and can move forward and, and make, you know, make things better and that the GSAs will make things better going forward. But, um, and the public comment pro com the comments that we get in our review period uh, that's open now will be very helpful. Okay. It looks like, so I'm afraid our time is up for this session. I wonder if we can just give our, our um, panelists just one minute to wrap up if they'd like it. Okay. Any concluding remarks? Um, well, just to say that, you know, our team continues to work hard. We are our, our whole, uh, you know, region offices and headquarters have all moved to teleworking. And for those, um, you know, folks who are able to telework and that don't have, you know, young kids or whatever, um, this is actually, you know, from a GSP review point of, uh, standpoint is, is a good time to be, you know, at home reviewing plans. So our team continues to make progress, um, and, and in a pretty seamless way. And so, you know, we are, we're making headway uh, on the reviews and I look forward to providing updates as we, as we get a little further along. Thanks, Natalie. All right, um, just want to thank everyone for um, having me on this panel today to uh, to talk about the state board role and and where we are right now. And um, we are ready for state using state intervention authorities as appropriate, but really the goal is successful local groundwater management. And we are committed to coordinating and working closely with DWR um, to try and and get there um, as quickly as possible and um, you know have sustainable groundwater management for the state. If you have any questions um, later or that we didn't get to feel free to reach out. Um, you can email me at natalie.stork at waterboards with an s.ca.gov and we've got our state water board um, Sigma website for the groundwater management program. Um, our fact sheets are on there. I think the link will be sent out and feel free to reach out. Catherine. Um, so I know it's uncertain when and how the legislature is going to be back, but that doesn't mean that we're not working. And I want to echo what um, Craig and Natalie have said. Um, this is a great time to send us information about your concerns about a GS, uh, GSP or otherwise, you know, you're welcome to send the comments that you sent to DWR to the committee. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to, as long as things don't go crazy over here, we'll look at them and we'll try to use them as a, um, a way to really keep the checks and balances going. Um, and then to the departments, you know, I hope that the legislature can be helpful to you guys as we move forward. Um, and I know that process is, um, you know, challenging. It probably goes through budget, but, um, you know, we do actually want to be supportive of the, uh, this bill and, and the implementation of it. Thank you. And I just want to thank all three of our panelists. This was really enlightening. We got far more questions than we could hope to get through in this time period. So I appreciate you all being open to getting more questions down the line. And we'll continue maybe to have these uh, check-in meetings a little more frequently so we can narrow down the scope at each session. Anyway, thank you very much. I think I'm turning it over to, to Danielle now to bring us into a break for our next session. Uh, that is correct. Thank you, everybody. Um, so this is your break time. We're adjusting the schedule a little bit. It's now just about 1.15. We'll still give you your 10-minute break. Please 